Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Every time. Okay, welcome here, everybody. Uh, this will be lecture number 11 in our, in our short course, A General Introduction to the Bible. And um, before we do a quick review about uh, where we've been, just to kind of get us caught up and get our minds in gear, uh, why don't we ask God to help us uh, with the study so that um, our time here is maximally effective and that Christ is honored, and uh, we're going to ask him to teach us things, uh, it's important things that uh, maybe I haven't even thought of while, while I was making the lesson plan. So let's ask the Lord for some help here. Let's do that. Uh, gracious, loving Father, in Jesus' precious name, uh, we thank you, God, uh, that uh, we're healthy. We can come to this place uh, on our own power. Thank you that uh, we can afford Bibles, we can afford books, and we have time to sit down to take a few moments to give you special attention and to give your book special attention. We pray uh, for this evening, Lord, by your spirit that you would help us all to learn the things you want to teach us. Uh, we pray, God, that we hear from you and that your saints are better equipped. And I pray this for all those that are here live uh, and for all those who are listening by MP3 or watching videos. We pray, God, that uh, you empower your people, that you educate them, equip them, empower them to be about your business uh, while we tarry and during these last days. So thank you, God. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, friends. Well, this is our uh, part of our Solid Ground series. Uh, this is the first course in the series, A General Introduction to the Bible, we're calling it. And remember, as a, uh, as a basic template, we are going through Max Anders' 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. And, uh, and of course, we're changing a few things and we're adding some things. But uh, basically, the credit goes to him for his brilliant approach. Uh, remember the basic structure of the Bible. You have an Old Testament, those books written before Jesus, that is to say prior to 2,000 years ago. And you have a New Testament, uh, which talks to us about Jesus and about his earthly ministry, his sinless life, miracles, atoning death and resurrection. We're focused in this course so far, we're still in the Old Testament. Those 39 books written before Jesus walked the earth. And remember, uh, the Old Testament is split into three different kinds of books. You've got historical books, you have poetical books, and you have prophetical books. We've already gone through the history books, the historical books, and we see that Bible history in the Old Testament is broken down into nine time blocks called eras. And important things happen within each era. We went through the poetical books. God talks to us in a variety of genre. One way he talks to us is through poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. God imparts to us very important, precious spiritual truths and practical instruction for living in the poetry books. Where we left off last week, we were in the books of prophecy. Uh, the, the remaining section of books in the Old Testament are prophecy books. These are books written by prophets. These are God's spokesmen on planet Earth. These are Jewish people called by God to, uh, to do a variety of things, to tell people important things that they just couldn't learn any other way. You know, there's some things that you can't know if God doesn't actually reveal them to you propositionally. You know, all of us know that God is real in our heart of hearts. We know there's a creator. We see his signature on the created order. God has put into our, into our hearts a sensitivity to his moral imperatives, objective moral values and duties. We're sensitive to these things in our hearts. We don't need special revelation for that. We're born with this, okay? But uh, you would never know that Jesus is the son of God who died to pay your sin debt and that he rose again from the dead and he makes intercession for you in, in the third heaven, you could never know that if God didn't tell you in the Bible, okay? The prophets of the Old Testament were telling Israel and other nations important things that they couldn't know any other way. It makes the prophecy books very, very, very important. Remember the, prophe the prophecy books or the prophetical books in the Old Testament are, spl are split into two. You have the major prophets and then you have the minor prophets. And we're still looking at the major prophets tonight to start off with. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are the major prophets. Uh, we're talking, we call them major prophets because of the length of their books, 
Um, not because they're more important than anybody else. They're, I mean, all those books are important. All the prophecy books are important. They all talk to us about Jesus, some way, shape, or form. Uh, they were imparting important truths for their day, too. Most of them were warning Israel of impending judgment. They were calling people back to the law. They were calling people back to right living. And they were, uh, they were warning people of impending judgment if they didn't repent and think again. So um, Isaiah, uh, about 700 years before Christ, we call him the Christmas prophet. And we were looking at Isaiah. Uh, we looked at Isaiah 118. Remember, God says, come, let us reason together. Our God is not irrational. He's not arbitrary. He's not like the king of Babylon. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He could issue a, an edict, and the next day he could totally change that. Completely arbitrary, capricious, just do anything he wants. Our God has a reason for the things that he does. Our God is reasonable. And he made us rational, reasonable creatures too, and we can dialogue with our God. Come, let us reason together. Uh, and he makes a promise. If you do this, uh, he, he can make your sins as white as snow. They're, they're like scarlet right now, but God can change that. He can wash you clean and forgive you your sin debt. I think we left off here, Isaiah 9. This is the Christmas verse where a child was going to be born, a son given. See, the child, uh, the child is born. Jesus entered the human family at a finite time in human history, but he's been the son throughout all creation history. See? Um, he didn't become the son of God at birth. He already was the son of God. He is called the mighty God. This one who would be born into the human family, he's called the mighty God, and yet he's the king of Israel. You know, it's very mysterious. We understand, as New Testament Christians, we understand the Trinity. Our God is one being, but three persons. Our God is tri-personal. And that's very mysterious, and we don't have it all figured out, for sure. But we do, we do know this, that love relationship in the Trinity has existed from all eternity. And that explains why we consider love to be the greatest of ethics. Because it, it's a reflection of the character and nature of God, our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? And here we have the prophecy that one member of the Trinity would take on a human nature. He would be called the mighty God. He'd be a child born, and yet he's the mighty God. And yet he's the king of Israel because he's born into the house and lineage of David. Um, I'd like to read this lengthy portion of Isaiah chapter 11 for you uh, because this is so uh, incomparably important great in its importance. I do want to read this, okay? Remember, this is like 700 years before Christ. Isaiah says this, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, and the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like, like the ox. And the suckling, sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. We have a guarantee from God here that one day the king of Israel will sit and preside over the whole planet. There will be a beautiful restoration to a very good created order. And you see, this is one of the reasons why I am a uh, young earth creation. I'm not ashamed to say that I think Genesis 1 to 11 is real, legitimate, honest, straightforward history. God created the world in six days, real days, no evolution, no death before sin, uh, and you see, you need to look at it like, like that. Otherwise, all these promises of restoration don't make any sense. When God made the world, it was very good. There was no death. Man sinned and brought death into the world. Uh, and animals started to kill each other. And there was bloodshed. And things were dying. But Genesis chapter 1 is so utterly clear about this. Uh, Genesis 1, verses 29 to 31 no animal death either. Not just no human death, no animal. Nothing is eating anything, no bloodshed. Uh, and it goes into great detail in Genesis 1. All the green herbs were for every beast of the field, everything that creeps, all the fowl of the skies. Uh, 
it, the Bible just doesn't multiply references to this for no reason, you know. When we see a world full of death and disease and, you know, and, and decay, you don't blame God for that. The, the Bible is making sure that you understand that humankind sinned and brought these horrible things into the world. But the promise here is that there's going to be a wonderful restoration when Jesus returns. He is the, the one that comes from the house and lineage of, of Jesse, of David, son of Jesse. Jesus sits on the throne of his father, David. He reigns and rules over a restored, created order. And here you see dangerous animals, the viper, the cockatrice, the asp, uh, lions. They behave like peaceful vegetarians. Little children can play with them. And that's not science fiction. That is going to happen. You know, by the time this lecture is done in 20 minutes, you're 20 minutes closer to a restored, created order. Can you imagine? Praise the Lord. Who wants to say praise the Lord, right? I mean, yeah. I like this uh, in verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. No more war. No more hurting each other. We watch the news. You can't even, you, you can't even figure out this planet. You, you talk to people who come from war-torn countries. I did last week. Hey, what, what's everyone fighting about over there? Well, it's very complicated. Right? Well, short answer. Who knows? <laughs> it's incredible, you know? No more of that nonsense. The, and it says, uh, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. You want to know something? There's not one square inch of sea bottom that isn't covered by water. And the whole world will know the Lord. And I can't wait. And we'll have, all of us will have something in common. In fact, the most important thing in common. We'll all worship the same God together. That's the future. That's the future. Well, uh, if we're still with Isaiah here, Isaiah chapters 24 to 27, just for your notes, uh, this is sometimes called the little apocalypse. Uh, if you go to the book of Revelation, you read all kinds of neat things in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is focused mainly on things that are future to our own day. End times, we call that eschatology, study of the last things. The book of Revelation is very difficult if you don't have Daniel mastered. We'll talk about Daniel yet tonight. You get, if you master Daniel, the book of Revelation is going to help help you a lot. All of a sudden it makes sense. But if you go now to the book of Isaiah, chapters 24 to 27, you'll notice uh, some grand parallels there in those chapters between what Isaiah prophesies and what John prophesies in the book of Revelation. And I'm, we won't go into any detail tonight on that. That's just for your notes, the little apocalypse. Now, ahead in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53 is perhaps uh, the clearest and most spectacular prophecy in the Old Testament uh, that refers us to Jesus, to his atoning work on the cross. And uh, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but I have just a couple verses here, verses 5 and 6 of Isaiah 53. Uh, I mean, if you're a Christian, you, you just see New Testament truth all over this, don't you? Look what Isaiah said. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And if you, I mean, you just need to read, read the entire chapter 53. Actually begin in 52. Because it's just one big long thought there. Right goes right through the chapter break. You see Jesus there. You've got to see him. Uh, and in fact, I have, I have a friend in Washington. Uh, he was uh, speaking to... Um, a Jewish fellow, I think it was a rabbi, and uh, he, he read this, and the guy said, I don't want to hear all that, I don't want to hear any of this New Testament theology stuff, and he said, this is from the old, this is, don't you believe the prophet Isaiah, you see, uh, he himself was raised a Catholic, and uh, nominal, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't really a Christian, he's a nominal Catholic, but he remembers reading Isaiah 53, or hearing it read, and he really thought it was so obvious to him that it was talking about Jesus. He wasn't even a Christian. He thought that was New Testament. See, it's just so obvious. If we move ahead from Isaiah to Jeremiah, he's the next of the prophets. Jeremiah is constantly, you'll find, pleading with Israel, pleading, well, actually with Judah, the southern kingdom. He's pleading with them, repent, get right with God, repent, uh, obey the law, get back to the law. Get back to God. 
Uh, but Jeremiah, he laments throughout his writings about the spiritual condition of his people. He says this in uh, the second chapter, verse 8. The priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Uh, Jeremiah makes it very clear to us, as do the other prophets, but Jeremiah in particular, God is really uh, after us. He loves us. He is pleading with us. He is pursuing us. It breaks his great heart when we turn our back on him because it really hurts us too, you know. He is worthy of our honor. He is worthy to be obeyed. He is worthy to be believed without question. But he also, uh, it seems to me, laments the fact that we turn from him because it's, it hurts us too. He, God loves his children, you know, and it hurts us to follow that which is less than God, you know. And this here, they that handle the law knew me not. If there ever was a verse that applied to our age, here it is. With more cults that have a Bible in their hand than you can count. Mishandling the Bible, misquoting the Bible, uh, misapplying the Bible. Yeah, the Bible is so powerful, you know. It's like nuclear strength stuff, the Bible. Um, but you can do constructive things with nuclear power or you can decimate cities. And the Bible's kind of like that. If you handle it right, it's a tremendous blessing to people. If you handle it incorrectly, you can lead people to hell. You need to know the Lord before you start handling the Bible and teaching it, right? And Jeremiah is uh, lamenting this. Jeremiah says this. This is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Uh, this, there's that symbolism of water again. Uh, God in the Old Testament said, I'm the fountain of living water, right? Uh, he says to, through Ezekiel, I will sprinkle you with clean water. In the New Testament, there's Jesus standing and speaking in God's place. He says, if anyone thirsts, come to me. Remember John 7? I'll give you water. He talked to the woman at the well in John 4. You drink of the water I give you, you won't thirst again, dear woman. See? Jesus is God. And he's making the same kind of offers to people that God makes to people. But Jeremiah, listen to what Jeremiah says here, or what God is saying through Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and then they've hewn out cisterns. Now think about it. In Israel, if you had a fountain of pure, clean, uh, cold, refreshing water, you know, run, running water, you could scoop a cup of water out and drink it. How refreshing. How wonderful. And God says, I'm that for you. I'm that for your soul. But you don't want that. So you want to, you want to dig a hole in the ground, a cistern, and that's, that's way worse. Even if it could hold water, who wants, who wants to drink from that? You know, the, the cistern is just a giant hole in the ground. And it stagnates, and bugs get in there. And that's why in Israel, they would, they would put some wine into that water. That's why Paul said, drink a little wine, Timothy. Because it may kill some of the, what's in there. The alcohol may kill some of it. And it's going to taste a whole lot better, you see? And they, they used to put screens on, the, on these cisterns to try to filter out the big bugs, but there's always bugs in there. So God says, look at you. I'm giving you clean, fresh, cold, refreshing water, running water, living water, and you want to dig a hole in the ground and drink that. But it's worse than that. They've got broken cisterns that can't even hold water. You reject God for this hole in the ground that can do nothing for you. There's nothing in there for you. Right? Now you understand this is all applied spiritually, right? You see that. What, I mean, what's wrong with these people? It's insanity, isn't it? And that's the age that we live in, actually. So, just to punctuate that, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah 23. Beautiful passage. Listen to this one. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in safety. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. 
Once again, we have the promise of a coming king. This, this is repeated throughout the scriptures. Uh, Israel will have her king. And by extension, the world will have a king. Right? The Bible teaches that when, G when King Jesus returns, he will reign and rule over a Jewish kingdom whose, border whose borders will extend globally. Uh, God uh, will reign and rule in the person of Jesus on the throne of his father David. Uh, you see it here. He is the branch, the righteous branch. He reigns and rules in the house and lineage of David. He is called the king. Israel will dwell in safety. We don't see that today. One day she will dwell in safety. And he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now think about it. That is a beautiful New Testament reality. You remember the verse? Is it 2 Corinthians 5.21? He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See the exchange? Marcus and I were talking about this just recently. How you have a sin debt and I do too. Or I did. But Jesus came and he died to pay your sin debt. So think about it like this. Here's a good way to think of it. You had a cup, and the cup was full of God's wrath because of what we've done to offend him in our sin. That cup was full. And Jesus came, and he took the punishment we deserve. It's like he drank that cup all the way down, and he presents you with an empty cup. And you say, thank you, God, for this empty cup. I've never been so happy for an empty cup. But then he turns around, and he says, I'll do one better. Not only do I, will I not force you to drink the cup of wrath, but I'll fill that cup with my righteousness. I'll impute my righteousness to your account. So it's not, just a, it's not just that you're forgiven, it's that you are granted the righteousness of Christ in him. That's awesome. And these are precious New Testament truths uh, that sort of poke their heads up all the way through the Old Testament too, right here in Jeremiah as well. Well, before that wonderful and awesome day when the Lord reigns and rules on planet Earth, the Bible predicts in both Testaments, in very strong language, there will be a coming time of great darkness on planet Earth. And of course, you understand that the, darkest, the darkness is deepest just before the dawn. This world will be as dark as, as it's ever been, darker than the days of Noah, just before the Lord Jesus breaks in upon the created order to throw the squatters off his planet and to reign and rule and to shepherd the nations with a rod of iron, okay? But here's a little uh, prediction here, Jeremiah 30, about that great and terrible time just before the Lord returns. Jeremiah 30, verses 7 to 9. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is, none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. That's just one passage among many that tell us that there will be a time of unparalleled darkness and distress for national ethnic Israel and anyone who wants to identify with her and her Messiah. It will be horrible, absolutely horrible. The book of Revelation goes into tremendous detail on this. You'll lose your head in the last days if you name the name of Christ. In fact, it'll be so dark, says Jesus, uh, that if you offer a cup of cold water to somebody who calls himself a disciple of Jesus, uh, you won't lose your reward. You will, be, you will be putting your neck on the line. It'll be, that dark. it'll be that dark in the world that one simple gesture towards a favor towards God and his people, and you just might lose your life. And God says, that, I, I honor that. I'll honor that right there. See? And it's kind, of, it's kind of a truth, isn't it? That when the darkness is really, really deep, even a tiny little flame can throw light very, very far. And that's kind of the picture in the last days. But of course, Jesus will break into uh, the created order and he will put an end to all that horrible time that's going on there. Uh, notice, please, though... It is the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a time of tribulation for God's people, Israel. Okay? It's one of the reasons why I, I, I can't be dogmatic about this, but I, I really I come down on the side of a pre-tribulation rapture. I really think that we're out of here, raptured off the planet to be with Jesus, 
just prior to the Great Tribulation period. Okay? Now, I could be wrong about that. I could be reading the scriptures incorrectly. Um, but but I have, I've got some reasons for holding this view. And it's not just because I don't want to pass through that horrible time. I think there are scriptural reasons for that. But that's an intramural debate. That, that's between brothers who see the Bible pretty much the same, right? The timing of the rapture. That, that's a finer detail. Well, listen to this one. Jeremiah 31, looking ahead to the new covenant. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. See, that covenant at Sinai, that was never to be forever. That was not, for, that was not forever. Uh, Paul tells us in the New Testament what the reasons were for Sinai. And when Jesus came, uh, he put an end to that. Jesus is the end of the law to righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay? And the Old Testament, Jeremiah, 600 years before Christ. Jeremiah is looking ahead to the new covenant. Here it is. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and they shall... And they, I will be their God and they shall be my people, is what I'm trying to say. Um, this is the new covenant. This is the covenant that you and I are a part of. Okay? When you become a Christian, you're born again. You ever hear that, born again? Jesus said, if you're not born again, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. When you come to Jesus by faith alone and he becomes your personal Lord and Savior, you're born again. You're a new creature spiritually. And all of a sudden, uh, you become spiritually sensitive to his law. Certain forms of entertainment are not entertaining anymore, or shouldn't be. And you, you just get better at being like Jesus. And of course, you never attain to that standard while you walk in this life, in this present order of things. But there is a thing called sanctification, where that new birth launches you on a whole new trajectory. And day by day, moment by moment, you're being conformed into the, into the image of Christ. See? That's the new covenant. It's a way better covenant. The old covenant was a law that said, you keep this thing or you've had it. And of course, nobody could. And the law just condemned us. And, and the law had no power to save at all. It just showed us how ugly sin was. It showed us how far we had fallen. And it revealed our powerlessness to save ourselves and to get right with God. And that's all it was intended to do. <laughs> And by the time Jesus came into the world, Israel was supposed to recognize that they were in desperate need of this new covenant, where you come to Jesus as a lost sheep in need of salvation by grace through faith, and he would offer it to you. See? Now that's a way better deal, isn't it? A way better covenant. A new covenant. Well, Ezekiel, we'll end with this verse. Ezekiel 36 uh, sort of echoes what Jeremiah was saying. Ezekiel, one of the exile prophets. Same line of thinking. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give, give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. See, same thought exactly. You're looking ahead to the new covenant. The new covenant promises that if you enter this kind of relationship with God, you don't just get forgiven, you get reborn. You get a new identity, a new spiritual nature. And we're waiting. See, the spirit of God in the New Testament is called the deposit. And God makes that great change in your heart and mine too. And he says, that's the deposit. That's the guarantee that I'm not done with you. Because one day the body is going to get changed too. Same body, brand new characteristics, attributes, nature. It'll be unlike anything you've ever seen. And that spiritual, that new spiritual nature you have, the seal of the Holy Spirit in your life, that's the guarantee. God's not done with you. That's all part of the new covenant that Jeremiah was looking for. See? Little hints all through the Old Testament that there was something new and better coming, infinitely better. 
And that's the grand theme of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The writer of the Hebrews looks back on all this and he says, my Hebrew brothers, isn't Jesus much better? Better than angels, better than Moses, better than the old covenant. It's just better, infinitely better. See, that's the grand theme of the whole Bible. So if you, <laughs> can we sum it up like that? The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. Thank you. No one has any argument with that, right? <laughs> okay. Well, friends, that's uh, 30 minutes. Why don't we take a break and we'll return with lecture number 12 in our series, okay? Let's do that.